So we're actually going to get started, uh, and we have a lot of material to go through. Uh, Daniel has decided that I'm going to start doing these in Google Docs. And so I was like, oh, okay, that sounds great. But I didn't realize that the formatting would change when you would go back and print it in Word. And so the formatting changed, and I ended up with a lot more material than what I thought I had. So we're just going to talk fast. So we're going to get through all of it. So if y'all could turn to Mark 9, 33 through 37. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. But I think y'all are capable. So, so we're good. Okay, so uh, Mark 9, 33 through 37. I really like how specific it is in detail. So, uh, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. In verse 33, and they came to Capernaum. So Capernaum was uh, kind of like Jesus' home base, which, you know, that was discussed like earlier. Uh, Tanya went over that. And it's a fishing village that's on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Like, how many times have your parents uh, said to you and your siblings or you said to your kids, like, you understand something's going on, and you're like, now's my time to intervene. I'm just curious. What were you all discussing? Jesus checks in on his disciples to see what they were discussing. I, I'm supposing maybe it was like kind of like an intense conversation, and he's just trying to figure out, like, get a feel and go, like, what's going on back there? Um, and so that also alludes to a teachable moment. Like, he's asking them because you obviously realize he's opening up this conversation. Verse 34. But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. They were silent because they knew better than to openly argue about such things. Jesus has been teaching them about the coming of the kingdom of God. They expected to have an exalted place uh, in that kingdom based on their service to Jesus now. But who would have the highest place? Whose throne would be the best? Who would be next to Jesus? And who would also be the furthest away? I think we also all can do this with our siblings where you're like, you kind of argue about who's the greatest, who's loved the most, who's what Molly's smiling. So I think maybe she's... You the baby? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sure everyone realizes that as well. Yeah, and if not, you remind them. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So verse 35, and he sat down and called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus sits down because that's what teachers did in that day. So he had something to share with them about the true path to greatness. So he's a teacher. He's sitting down. He's wanting them to come over. And that's really different than what people, uh, what they want to believe today and what the world wants us to believe is the true path to greatness. Here we see Jesus revealing part of God's value system, not man's. So the way to be great is to be the last of all and servant of all. This is an important teaching that's repeated in different ways by Jesus. So he does it uh, on into the, excuse me, on into uh, chapter 10, verse 43 through 44. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Luke 22 Verse 26, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader is one who serves. Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus is saying to his disciples, don't focus on raising yourself up and being recognized and served. Focus on lowering yourself and serving others' needs. And then Jesus gives the illustration in verse 36. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, taking him in his arms. 
So we have to remember, we kind of went over this last week, but you all know this. Uh, in biblical times, children were not held in the same high regard as they are today, specifically in our culture. They were often seen as no more than slaves until they grew up and could actually contribute something to society. They had no power and no social status. And so what does Jesus do? He gets one of those kids and takes them in his arms. That can also be translated, um, and it might even be this way in some of your old Bibles, uh, embracing him. Jesus hugs this child. It's a simple act of love. The giving of attention, the giving of affection. Jesus is saying, this is what I'm talking about. And he's doing it by word and by deed. So on our first mission trip to the Dominican, there had only been two other teams that were uh, going to work in the remote village. The village that we were working in actually was a dump site. And so the government had decided that they were going to allow our team to come in and clear out this dump site. And there's three of the poorest villages in all of the Dominican. And then they just kind of come down the mountain in order of, like, what, these are the three most poverty-stricken villages in all of the Dominican. And it ends in this dump site at the bottom. So, you know, it got cleaned up, and then we show up, and we're going to start building houses and a community center. And these kids, um, they really didn't have anyone in their life that truly cared for them. It's not the way you all would care for your children. A lot of these children, if they were 10 years, around 10 years old, um, they would work in the coal mine there. So they were minor miners. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> their parents weren't married. Um, and for some of these kids, their parents just weren't anywhere to be found. These kids, what would happen is some of these kids would work in the coal mine and they would earn whatever money um, and they would possibly pay someone to allow them to stay and it's just no more than like a little metal shack. Um, some, some people actually, their actual biological parent would pay someone about $5 a month to take in this child. And so you have to think, do you think those kids are being held? Do you think that someone's... Um, showing them that they're valued and they're loved. And so it is a really odd thing when you have a language barrier because we didn't speak Spanish. Um, and I, re I, this is, I know how to say, where are my pants? That is a weird thing to, <laughs> to know how to say in Spanish. That was the one thing I remembered from high school Spanish. So that is a weird thing because that never comes up in conversation, by the way, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> just to be clear, uh, but it's really hard when you have that language barrier, and now all of a sudden, here you are showing up in this place where these kids have never really seen anyone that looks like you. They don't know what you're up to. Um, hugging isn't a thing in their culture. Yes, my people. Um, <laughs> But, it, you know, well, how do you show affection to someone that you have a language barrier and you don't know how to do that? These children have no voice, and so you're like, I've got to figure out how to get through to them. So verses 36 through, through 37, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So we went back trip after trip, and the trust kept building with these kids, and they all remembered Daniel's beard. And at the time, Daniel's beard was getting rather epic, and he also was growing his hair out so he could donate it to a locks of love type thing. What was really funny is a lot of people didn't realize they just thought he was becoming a hippie, but he was actually growing it out for someone <laughs> to donate his hair. Um, but his beard was gigantic. And so these kids would remember that because people don't have beards down there. And they would, you know, want to run up to Daniel and show how tall they had gotten um, and so what we would do is go and these kids would slowly but surely just kind of walk up and just grab your hand. And I would be like, don't look at them. You'll start crying. Don't act like anything's going on. And, you know, you're thinking, okay, they're figuring this out, like how to show this affection. Um, they also, the, the girls, I 
this, I rolled my hair today, so this is what my hair looks like with hot rollers. But, and so um, the girls would really want to braid my hair because it's really exciting, and they would pull it till I was basically bald. But, you know, again, you're building that relationship with them. Our investment was to actually uh, get in their lives, get them to trust us so that we could share Jesus with them. And that wasn't easy, and it required a big investment. Our job to get to the final goal was we dug sewer lines, and uh, that is really hard in Dominican Caribbean heat, and we worked in concrete, and then we dug some more sewer lines, and then some more sewer lines, and then some more sewer lines, and that's just kind of what we did, but what was funny is I'm in literally in the trenches, and I'm digging these, these lines, and the kids eventually would come to us. Um, these kids just had little value in their social structure, and they were the least amongst. Um, the elderly in our society, I think, are here in America are also forgotten. They're not revered. And uh, the girl that cuts my hair, her name's Birdie. How cool is that name? Um, and she goes and she works at a retirement home. And she told me that these people, she was like, just think about it. When do they get touched? You know, these are people that rarely have someone come visit them. Just think about the only time these people are getting touched is when someone's doing their hair. And, I mean, it just crushed my heart because you're like, that's, that's true. They just don't have that. They're the link, least amongst us. We just kind of forget. We put them over there, and then we just kind of forget about them. Um, so how do we seek out worldly greatness? Greatness can be a word that we often kind of disassociate ourselves from. So how do you all want to be recognized as important? Do you want to feel significant? Do you do certain things to feel significant? Do you want someone to be impressed by something you've done? So maybe you share it on social media like, oh, hey, look at what I did. Um, perhaps you want to be the funniest and so you just try to always infuse that humor into something to try to always be the funniest one it's usually not open where we're trying to seek out that worldly greatness but it's something that we can uh, oddly strive for and not even realize that we're doing it like the disciples we know that we shouldn't openly pursue it but we do have those subtle ways of seeking to put ourselves above others so in a world where we're able to be so connected, we're also so disconnected. And we sometimes just want to feel like someone notices us and to feel special and to feel recognized. And Jesus' word to us, stop seeking worldly greatness amongst yourselves and be at peace with one another. And he says that in verse 50. Jesus is cutting right across human perception of greatness. When Jesus spoke here of being last and a servant of all, he's defining not only his own agenda, but the life that must be lived by his followers. To demonstrate his perception of greatness, he puts a little child among them, saying, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Greatness, he infers, does not consist in doing spectacular things that would be an unattainable and exhausting way to live. It consists of doing things, most of the time, just like tiny little ordinary things that we're doing in our daily lives with a spirit of meekness and servanthood. So let's go in chapter 9 and read verses 42 through 50. There is a fly that's in this room, and if someone kills it, I might give you a door prize. So... <laughs> I'm, I think it's driving us all crazy. So verse 42 through 50. <clears throat> Whoever causes one of these little ones uh, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter um, life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if, if, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. 
So this discusses that high value of life in the kingdom, leaving aside the sin that caused by, that's caused by deliberate interference of another person. Jesus moves abruptly to sin caused from within the life of the believer. So a lot of things can kind of be on the outside that are pressing in on each of us that, you know, you're just like, oh man, I totally failed in that situation. But this is talking about something that's from within us. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Jesus challenges us to rid ourselves of anything in our lives that ensnares us in sin and causes us to stumble in sin. Whether it's something we do, symbolized by our hand, or somewhere we go, symbolized by our foot, or something that we look at is symbolized by our eye, we need to get rid of it in a decisive and permanent way. Nothing is to be allowed to interfere with our faith in Jesus. But how many of us kind of have like the best intentions that we lay that thing down and we think, oh, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to not going to go to that place. I'm not going to look at that thing. Um, it can even just be something that causes you to covet. I mean, Pinterest can do that. I mean, so it can just be something, something that you're looking at. It doesn't have to be an extreme of porn, but it can include that. So whatever it is, lay it down and don't pick it back up. Don't go back to that place. If that's some place that tempts you and you go toward certain behaviors while you're there, don't go there again. Just remove yourself from that. We're commanded to get rid of anything that puts our faith in jeopardy. Anything that's contrary to faith in Christ, anything that's inconsistent with faith in Christ, anything that constitutes a denial of faith in Christ, Anything that would expose our faith as non-genuine. This week, if you have that tiny little voice that says something like, is this my something? Do I, do I need to get rid of this? Do I, need to, do I need to really just walk away from, let's just say, social media? Um, you need to pray about that. But probably if you have that tiny little voice saying something, it probably is a thing that you need to get rid of. Um, but again, you need to go to the Lord in prayer and you are definitely going to need him to get rid of that. It's hard. People have that fear of missing out. That's a real thing. So um, definitely go to the Lord in prayer. On verse 49 and 50, Jesus makes several statements about salt. Uh, these statements and how these statements relate to their context are kind of something of a puzzle. And the conversation began back in verses 33 and 34, where the disciples were arguing about which of them was the greatest. Verse 35, his perspective of greatness as being servant of all. Verses 36 and 37, anything done in his name, even welcoming a child or giving a cup of water, as in verse 38 and 41. Verse 42, 48, teaching on values and priorities that require getting rid of anything that stands contrary to faith in him. He goes on to say, everyone will be salted with fire. Verse 49, both fire and salt have a purifying effect. And Jesus refers to them both together. When Jesus, what Jesus has been teaching us from verse 35 through 48 has been aimed at ridding the disciples of their aspirations to be the greatest. Summing this up, he teaches all, he teaches that everyone's going to be purified. Everyone has things in their lives that need to be eradicated. It could be our desire for greatness, our need for approval. Maybe it's your need for acceptance. And what we do by acceptance is we justify our own behavior by saying, that's just who I am. And in that same breath, you're asking someone else to change who they are. You have enough to worry about. Keep your eyes on your own paper. I mean, that's basically like what my parents would tell me. Like, you have enough to worry about with yourself. You don't need to worry about what somebody else is doing. So such things are just inconsistent in faith with Jesus. Salt, Jesus says, is good in verse 50. That is, the word of God is good. When uh, we unknowingly kind of go on autopilot, we kind of get used to hearing God's word, and it ceases to impact us. If we're resolved to find contentment on things that are contrary to the word, we start to kind of ignore the word. And I'm not saying that's intentional or on purpose, but I think a lot of us have even shown up at church and you leave and you're like, I don't really 
remember anything. And it's because your mind was racing with a bunch of other things. You're just kind of in autopilot. The word can lose its saltiness for us. But then I think, okay, name one other book that has thousands upon thousands of people that study it for their entire lives and write books about it. And every time you pick it up, you see something that you never saw before and it's revealed to you. That doesn't happen like To Kill a Mockingbird or, you know, a Tolstoy book or something like that. You know, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty incredible that we have this one book that thousands and thousands of people study their entire lives. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know, and then you want to know more. It shouldn't ever lose its saltiness. It, if it fails to purify us, it's because we're, we're failing to be in the word and failing to listen to it. We all stand in need of the purifying impact of the word. Jesus says to us, have salt in yourself. And Paul puts it this way in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's then, and only then, having put aside our own agenda and having taken on the word of Christ that the salt that we can begin to be purified by our personal clamor for recognition and greatness. And then we can go to Jesus and say, help me, God, I really need you. And we can start to live at peace with others. When something's done in the name of Jesus, it infers that uh, that person is on Jesus' side for him, not against him. And that's the most important thing of all, to align ourselves with Jesus, not with our own agenda, not with this person hurt my feelings. I want to say something back to them. You're aligning yourself with him. We park that own agenda, our own calendar, and our own wants. What if we tried that this week? Like every single inconvenience we think, we just have that little thought that pops in, God created this time. This is his time. Every inconvenience, this is his time. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, somebody gets in front of you in line at Target, um, what, whatever that is, this is his time, and you just look at it that way. What is it in this moment where I can do something in his name and give him glory? Just kind of put that in your mind somewhere, and maybe subconsciously it'll pop in the next time you're inconvenienced this coming week. So in the beginning of Mark 10... It starts out with teaching about divorce, and that's in verses 1 through 10. I really had this moment where I thought, well, here I am. I'm a big, giant trash bag, and I (laughs) I was really stuck in this spiral of overthinking, and I read it and read it and read it, and just I was not sure how to approach this. And so I'm in a... um, like, read you an exchange I had with Tanya. And right now, seriously, dude, like, my knees are so shaky right now. <laughs> it's so weird being really vulnerable. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the, the text message. Imagine how long this was in a text, first of all. That's how ridiculous this is. So this is me. I start out to Tanya. I say, hey, yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how you start a text message. So the class has scripture regarding divorce. I don't want to, I don't have a thing to hide because this is my story and how I came to know Christ. I was a broken sinner with no hope. I did many things that I feel shame for and wish they hadn't happened, but I wouldn't lie about them. My question is, I fear the broadcast of me being divorced could turn some off from the rest of the lesson, but I also feel it's reflective of how God uses the broken, damaged, and unqualified. I want to be transparent, not go into detail. I definitely don't mean that at all. I just mean about being divorced. Do you think it's okay to disclose this to the class? I don't want it to if you feel like it's going to damage the learning structure. I'm not concerned with the people knowing. I feel um, hopefully if they see me now, they'll probably, I hope they'll be able to go, wow, but God. So this is me. (laughs) So I have divorce in my past, and, you know, it's like right now I feel like I'm going to burst into tears just because it's hard just being that vulnerable. Um, And not to go into too many details, but if you all were in other classes that I've uh, taught, then you all are kind of aware of some of it. Um, I burned my life to the ground, and then I dug a hole, and then I caught that hole on fire, and then I lived in that hole. And I was—a lot of times what's funny is if you tell someone you're divorced— 
it seems like if you got divorced after two weeks, no one really feels, they're like, oh, okay, well, then I understand. But then when I tell them I was married for 10 years, then they're like, oh, wait. And all of a sudden now that seems worse to them. Like we have like these varying degrees of like, oh, okay, I was willing to accept it if it was two weeks, but 10 years, you know, now I really have to give you my judgment. Um, I take complete ownership of that divorce. God hates divorce, and so do I. I don't think anyone says, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to do a scrapbook because I want to be divorced, and I want to do a scrapbook to see what that looks like. I mean, it is a horrifying thing that has a gigantic ripple effect, and you carry that with you for the rest of your life. Um, It affects everyone in your life, and having gone through this, It's enabled me to step into really messy situations with others and minister to them in ways I didn't think would ever be possible. Um, I also think that it has helped in ways to um, see certain behaviors in people that they don't realize that you see right through them and you can completely see what's going on in their lives and you just kind of easily step in. Um, But it's It's hard because there is a shame that goes along with being divorced in the church. And so I thought I was a dirty trash bag and that I would be of no use to God. I was like, that's it. But God's plans are just, sorry, they're just so much bigger than my failures. So, yeah. Divorce is not, so. it's hard to look at your mom. (laughs) So... Go to the back of the class. Yeah, (laughs) Divorce is not something new that modern culture is battling. It's been around for thousands of years. People don't have marriage problems. People have sin problems. We've got to stop labeling it as, oh, we have marriage problems. People have sin problems. Marriage is based on a commitment, and God hates unfaithfulness. This can go beyond sexual infidelity to wandering eyes, which lead to affection placed somewhere it shouldn't be. This destroys trust. The commitment and breaks down, it can break down the commitment and it can stop communication. God's hatred of divorce flows from his hatred of unfaithfulness. Divorce is a concession and the grounds of divorce are very few. I'm not making a statement to say in a situation where if someone's in a situation of abuse, they should stay. Um, I went into an abusive relationship directly after my divorce because I truly told myself "This this is what I deserve. And it is a really hard cycle to break free from when you feel like you deserve that. And that's just kind of where you are. Um... The divorced need compassion just as much as anyone else who falls short of God's expectations. He readily forgives and restores people who seek his pardon. God values faithfulness. And on a side note, uh, a couple weeks ago, I talked to Lisa about the marriage retreat. And just, we had talked about the hotel and just some things that, you know, had come up with that. And I just really had that moment where I thought, I'm so grateful that Lisa and Jeff, a year, like the moment the marriage retreat is done, she's already working on the next one. She's working on our marriages to figure out how they can serve us all year long. And a lot of people have said, oh, you know, something like that. It just really isn't my thing or whatever. Well, well, my thing is working on my marriage, and that's why I'm there. You know, do I like games and group activities? And th- those really aren't our things, but working on my marriage is my thing. And so I can go, I'm willing to go, and I enjoy it so much because it's a dedicated, focused time. And I'm just, Lisa, I'm just so grateful that you all spend all year long, planning and prepping down to the tiniest detail so that all of us have the opportunity to work on our marriage. And I'm just, I'm really appreciative of that. So thank you very much. Sorry to embarrass you. (laughs) So ultimately, God hates divorce and so do I. So that was heavy. So let's go to uh, Mark 10, 13 through 16. 
And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. These little children were not brought to Jesus for healing, nor were they old enough to be taught. What the parents sought for them and what Jesus gave to them was, was a blessing. He took the children in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them, from verse 16. When, he read that Je- when we read that Jesus blessed them, we should not understand this blessing to be like a physical or material terms. And I think sometimes we can just unknowingly switch that. So we have to be really careful that that's not what it meant. And it's evident in the next section of Mark's gospel. This is what he wants us to do for everybody, to embrace and to bestow on us the blessings of God. The heart of God longs for us to come to him, to return to him, to believe in him, and thus to be blessed. What happens is our guilt gets in the way. We credit our sins with more power than God's forgiveness. And I think that's really what I did is like I took that back seat where I'm like, I'm not getting in. I'm not going to participate because, well, how could I? You know, what, what could I possibly offer? Well, that's crazy to even think that, that you're just like, I mean, I'm damaged but he can use me that's okay I think we're all damaged in our own way and we all come with our own baggage but we have to recognize that our sins are just so God's forgiveness is so much bigger we magnify our sin and minimize God's grace we exalt our sin and despise God's love so here in Mark 10, 15, Jesus confronts all of our twisted religious thinking with his simple statement. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter in. Our faith is to be childlike, not childish. Let's go on to uh, verses 17 through 22. <clears throat> and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus has told us that to enter the kingdom of God, we must do so like a little child, totally dependent and helpless, not counting or even contemplating our own merit. But this rich young man, uh, he wasn't... He didn't want to hear that. He comes to Jesus asking the very question that Jesus has just answered. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice the guy's mindset. He believes he has to do something to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus answered him in terms of his own mindset. He listed the final six of the Ten Commandments. In addition, Jesus also told him, no one is good except God. But the young man, having addressed Jesus as a good teacher, now promotes his own goodness and declares that he's kept all of these commands since he was a boy. And most likely, in terms of an external obedience to these commandments, he had. Jesus does not correct him. Jesus perceived that the rich young man's problems was not that he owned many possessions, but that he cared more about them than he did about doing God's will. So rather than discuss the young man's claim to obedience, Jesus moves the conversation to a deeper level. For there are four other commandments, commandments focused on our attitudes to God. In particular, the first commandment in which God commands, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus challenged the young man at the very center of his being. It's so specific to who he is. Like, I don't know if anyone in here has ever struggled with materialism, um, 
if that is something that you struggle with, then this certainly speaks to you. It spoke to me. Jesus challenged the young man at the very center of his being. What he asked him to do was, in effect, a challenge to put God first and to value eternal life with God, to value admission to God's kingdom more than he valued his earthly wealth and possessions, to value God more than he valued himself. Mark tells us his face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The word translated face fell means, you know, he became gloomy like a darkening sky. It would seem that at this point his love of his possessions was greater than his desire to have eternal life and that his wealth was more important to him than God. We do not hear that he ever believed or that he chose to follow Jesus. And I think that's interesting. You know, here's this extremely specific story talking to the heart of his matter. And we never know, did, did he sell everything? I mean, he could have walked off and been like, oh, I'm really sad. I'm about ready to sell all my stuff. You know, you don't really know if he did know Jesus. The irony of this, this man wants to know how to, inter- how to inherit eternal life. This man wants to know how to enter the kingdom of God. He who is the king stands before him and commands his allegiance, and he doesn't even realize it. The man seeks to be accepted by God. He who is God stands before him, loving him, and he acts like he doesn't even know it. He wants to know the way to life. He who is the way says to him, follow me, and he turns and walks away from him. We aren't told what he decides. Perhaps this man did sell all those possessions. But also, maybe he was clinging tightly to what the world offers, and he doesn't loosen his grip at all. Um, I kind of appreciate that we didn't find out exactly what that is, because I think that all of us can have that struggle of that thing that we're still holding on to, or something that we did finally decide to let go of. And for me, I didn't let go. God just was like, okay, I'm going to see you this one, and I'm going to take it all away. And so he loosened that grip because he took it all away. (laughs) And so I appreciate that in this, there you're left wondering kind of what happened with that. So a little child unencumbered by perceived worthiness, unencumbered by wealth, unencumbered by self-sufficiency, would have run straight into the arms of Jesus. Not so for the rich, young, law-abiding man. Often in the Dominican, people would say, you know, we would look at each other and go, it seems like these people are just so open. I wish we didn't have all the things we have vying for our attention. We're just unencumbered when we're down there. And then you think, oh my gosh, our possessions possess us. And it just feels in... The worst poverty you could kind of imagine, it just ends up being easier in certain ways because there, there aren't all the other things. So let's go on to Mark 10, 23 through 31. <clears throat> and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have everything and followed, we have left everything and have followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands and with persecutions in the age to come, uh, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus' comment to the disciples when the young man walked away was, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed the disciples. 
When Jesus repeated his statement, he added, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed the disciples even more. So let's look at just that verse 25 in in chapter 10. Let's look at what that means. So some say that the eye of the needle refers to the needle's eye. It's a low gate in Jerusalem, so they had uh, what they would do is they would kind of close up shop at night. They didn't want people to come in, and so uh, there was a small gate that you could enter in through. It was a smaller man-sized gate that opened at night when the main gate was closed. So I kind of picture like a hobbit door. (laughs) So that's kind of like it's just like a smaller gate. It'd be really difficult to get a camel through, but not impossible. An animal that large would have to be unsaddled, stripped of all of its possessions, and men would have to put a lot of effort to actually get it through the door. They would have to push and pull. And while that imagery really does work, and I think that it certainly does apply, Jesus had something else in mind. We have to be really careful when we're reading God's word that we can't go, okay, that's what that meant. And yeah, I can totally see that. And then you move on. But he had something else in mind. What Jesus is talking about is an impossibility. There will always be people who want to make salvation within the grasp of struggling man. Work hard enough, try hard enough, and save yourself through your effort. No, Jesus is talking about an impossibility. God continues working where man has given up. I'm so grateful for that mercy. Yeah. Verse 26 and 27. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus tells the rich young man to sell all his possessions and give everything he had to the poor. In uh, traditional Jewish wisdom, they held uh, great wealth as a sign of blessings from God and favor. And then if you lived in poverty or you had sickness, that was a sign of God's curse. So this is not a universal mandate. It's a precise command to a particular person who worships a specific idol. And that specific idol for that specific person is wealth. The point Jesus makes is not that money is incompatible with salvation. He's only demonstrating for this person that there is one thing he's not willing to sacrifice for the sake of obeying for the sake of obeying Jesus. Jesus will continue to tell the disciples that to inherit the kingdom of God, they must let go of their desire for power and authority. With man it's impossible but not with God. To follow him Jesus calls us to be willing to surrender our idols. And that's going to look different in a room this size. That's going to be different for a lot of us. Paul sacrificed everything, including his life and his mission to spread the gospel. Still, he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. We need to consider what earthly treasure we're holding on to so tightly that our grip could pull a camel through the eye of the needle. Then we need to be able to open our hands and offer whatever it is as a sacrifice to God, letting go of it in its entirety. The disciples were brought up with the understanding that wealth is indicative of God's blessings. And so now they're puzzled. It's difficult for the wealthy, those assumed to be blessed by God, to be saved. How is it possible for anyone to be saved in verse 26? Jesus reinforced what he had already said by affirming the offensive conclusion that they had reached, that if it depends on man, it's not possible to be saved. But he immediately relieved the situation by adding, but not with men, all things are possible with God. Let's go to Mark 10, 32 through 45. Again, verse 32 through 45. And we were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, 
we want you to do for us whatever we we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you and he said to them what do you want me to do for you and they said to him grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory Jesus said to them you do not know what you're asking are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you, you must be servant, your servant. You must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. So shortly before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus predicted his own passion for a third and final time. Since Jesus' humiliating death on the cross was such a stumbling block for so many people, each of the synoptic writers repeat continually the message that Jesus knew beforehand. He would die and face death willingly and that the crucifixion was part of God's plan for the forgiveness of sins for all people. The idea of a suffering Messiah was strange to most Jews of the time, and this is shown in Luke 8.34. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. We see James and John reacted to Jesus' passion prediction with seeking honor from him. So again, look at verse 37. And they said to him, "'Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory.'" Their selfish request shows they were still thinking in terms of earthly kingdom for Jesus and we were preoccupied and they were preoccupied with greatness, fame and glory. They hadn't yet really uh, taken to heart Jesus repeated message that Christian discipleship really is about service to others. Matthew 20:20 20, 20, kind of this is like again I brought my chronological bible if anyone wanted to just kind of look through it but that's kind of where that comes in handy you can kind of see in Matthew 20 20 it softened a bit by their mother making the request Mark has it as their own words because it was a request of their own heart so let's go on to Mark 10 46 through 52 Jesus heals the blind Bartimaeus then they came to to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city a blind man Bartimaeus which means son of Timaeus, did I say that right? I'm, I butcher names, Timaeus, are we? Okay, uh, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was the son, or that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. One thing I found interesting is we have the the name of the blind man. It's Bartimaeus, which literally means the son of Timaeus. And of the many miraculous hearings, er, healings of Christ, it's rare that the gospel writers actually name the people who were healed, but they actually did it right here. Um, a reason could be that it shows accuracy and adds to the historical value of Christ's miracle. It increases the credibility of the story. I always think it's so funny when people say, oh, the book is just like a book of fables. And you're like, these are actual people. Like You can trace things back to them. Um, You can confirm this story just by going back and looking at Bartimaeus. All three synoptic gospels recount how Jesus healed a blind beggar while passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. Bartimaeus was completely confident in Jesus' ability to heal him. This reveals God's values 
God values complete, confident faith. So there's um, seven things that, as I read through that, that I was like, oh, we could learn these things from Bartimaeus. And it seemed so simple. So the first thing, he believed that Jesus could help him. It's that simple. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The second thing, he asked Jesus for help. And again, kind of plug in your own thing that you're holding tightly to, that you can't give up, that you're struggling with, whatever it is. These are very practical things. (coughs) Believe Jesus can help you. Ask Jesus for help. The third thing, he did not allow anything to stop him from seeking Jesus. Don't let anything get in your way. If it gets in your way, get rid of it. When Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus, many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. The fourth thing, he obeyed the calling of Jesus. So so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Jesus could have went to Bartimaeus, but instead he stood still and called Bartimaeus to him. Sorry, that gets me. I spent a long time running away from Jesus, and there's something going towards him. So I love that that's so specific, that he called him to him. It's why. Why did he do that? Because He does that for every one of us. He calls us, and those who answer his call are chosen to be healed, to be forgiven, and to be his disciples. It took an act of faith for Bartimaeus to step out blindly, to just grope around in his darkness to find Jesus. It also takes faith for every one of us to seek the light of Jesus in our own dark situations. However, once we step out and obey his calling, Jesus gives us sight. The fifth thing, he exchanged his old life for a new one in Christ. The fact that Bartimaeus threw aside his garment indicates that he made a conscious decision to submit himself to Jesus. We too must make up our minds that only Jesus can help us, that we're willing to surrender our problems, our needs, our our demons, our dreams, and in our entire lives to him. We have to make that decision to put off our old self and take on the new life of Christ. The the sixth thing is he was rewarded for his faith. Again, the sixth thing is he was rewarded for his faith. Jesus told him that his faith had made him well. More than sacrifices or anything else, God desires our faith in him. The seventh thing, he followed Jesus. Isn't that crazy that like in this short little section, there's all these like tiny little gems that you're just like, I can't, this is so, this is so great. He followed Jesus. After Bartimaeus received his sight from Jesus, he followed him. So again, he believed that Jesus could help him. He asked Jesus for help. He didn't allow anything to stop him from seeking Jesus. He obeyed the calling of Jesus He exchanged his old life for a new one in Christ. He was rewarded for his faith, and he followed Jesus. I mean, that is like a beautiful story right there. So the homework for you all is I want you all to listen to that tiny little voice. If there's something that comes up, really listen to that. Go to the Lord in prayer. See if that's something you need to get rid of. Probably is if you feel like it is. And then go ahead and read chapter 11 and 12.